Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I want to thank all of our volunteers because they have worked so hard this week just to get ready for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You don't want to miss it. We have four services on Sunday. I know you're going to be super blessed. But before we get started, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you know what? You're looking so much more finer than the last person I sat with last week. <laughs> just look at someone and be like, man, you're just so much better looking. That's a Good Friday right there, amen? Like, thank you, Jesus. You know what? God's upgrading the people around you, amen? I love that. You should be upgrading people around you, amen? You should. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this incredible day that we get to come together and, and remember what Jesus did. Lord, I pray that today that you would think through my mind and speak through my mouth. I pray that today that each and every single one of us would be reminded of the power of that cross. I thank you, Jesus, that you left us a symbol. You left us something significant that reminds the world of your great power. And I pray, Father, that tonight, if anyone has come in here to tonight in this place with challenges, with difficulties, with disappointments, if people have walked in here disillusioned, Lord, I thank you that they're going to leave empowered, encouraged, inspired, and motivated to be everything you've called them to be. Father, we thank you that we have the name that's above every name, and that name is Jesus. And so, Father, touch the hearts of every single life here today as we sit and receive what you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Cool. Well, you know, I want to talk to you tonight about, I mean, it is Good Friday, and, um, and I did say that God called it a Good Friday because it was our victory in progress. And we need to be reminded that the cross that Jesus died on 2,000 years ago still has the power to speak life into any situation that may look dead. And I love that God left us something symbolic that we're able to remember and look at as the world celebrates this Easter weekend. And when you look at the story of the cross, I want you to be reminded that there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah who 3,000 years before Good Friday prophetically spoke a word. And he began to prophesy regarding what Jesus would do on that Friday. It was incredible. If you begin to read all throughout the scriptures, as I've been, I've, I've preached so many messages on Easter, but it just amazes me how much richness of God's word there is and how much more revelation there is that God wants to speak to his church. That's the only book in the world that will always speak something fresh and new to you. And as I was sitting and reading story after story, scripture after scripture, I couldn't help but just begin to see the correlation from the Old Testament of the prophets that kept pointing to what Jesus would do on this Good Friday. It was pretty amazing. And three, I would say three. So we're going to be talking about different numbers here. So 3,000 years ago, Jesus is fulfilling a prophetic word that the prophet Isaiah spoke of. And when you look at the story of the cross, it wasn't just one cross. There were three crosses. And you have to literally take a step back and see the panoramic picture of these three crosses because these three crosses had three men, and one of them we know was the Son of Man, right? We know the Son of God, which was Jesus. And the other two were on the left and the right side of Jesus. And we know that as Jesus was on this cross being crucified, and not just crucified, guys. He was crucified in execution style. So it was beyond anything that we can think of. When you think about, and we had these made, the nine-inch nails that these three men were hanging on. Just think about this. They're, they're in this, this hill, and, and three crosses are there, and there's three bodies that are literally hanging by nails. Their bodies, their weight, they're, they're, they're in the heat of the day, and, and it was the most most horrible way to die as a criminal it was a 
a crucifixion of shame. It was a public shame. Not only for the people that were on the cross that were allowing everyone to see their their excruciating pain and their suffering. But just think about the shame of the family that had to sit there and watch and, and see and hear all the people talking about your family, the Ruiz family, the Mendez family, the Jones family, the Willards family, and everyone's just talking and gossiping and slandering. But the thing that Jesus experienced was so crucial. It was so heavy, so hard. But I want you to think about this. There's three crosses. And each cross represented something. And I don't know what cross you walked in with here today. But each one of us have literally walked with a cross of something. Let's take the cross on the left. We'll call that the cross of rebellion. We know what that guy was doing. He's there. He has a just sentence. He's a criminal. He's a thief. He is justly being given whatever the law stature was at that time, and he's experiencing that. But he's looking at Jesus, and he's mocking him. He's cursing him. He's, he's making fun of him while he's experiencing the same pain as the other guy. So just think about this. All three are experiencing the same pain, but all three are responding differently. The other guy on the right, he had the cross of regret. He had this, this cross of of, of I'm sorry. He had this cross of I need to make some changes. He had a cross of I, I, I hope that I can still make a change. I hope this guy who's in the middle, which the cross of the middle, we know that cross is the cross of redemption. And we have to be reminded on Good Friday that we are not just celebrating another cool service on Easter weekend, but we're remembering the power of a cross that can redeem us whether you're someone that's far away from God, that may, maybe you're here, you don't even believe in God. Maybe you struggle with believing in God. Or you're someone here that's been walking with God for a few years or many years, but you're struggling as well. You find yourself in a place of doubt. I don't know what cross you came in with, but I wonder who has crossed you. I wonder what the enemy has done in your life that has tried to come in and twist and hurt and cause you doubt and fear, and maybe some suffering. I wonder what trauma you're probably carrying today, things you have not been able to face because you've been facing it alone. But I'm here to tell you that you can face it with Christ. You can face it with Jesus. He wants to help you. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to restore you. But we have to come back to the revelation of this cross. We must. Let's read some verses here. Are you okay? Look at this. So the, so the cross on the left is the cross of rebellion. And we're going to talk about that at the end of the message. And i got to hurry up. Then the other one is the cross of regret. It's the cross of, man, I'm sorry. I've missed it. It's the cross of humble pie. It's the cross of, of I'm going to take some responsibility. It's the cross of, I have to make some changes. And how many know that it's never too late to make a change? It's never too late. It's not, look at your neighbor and say, it's not too late for you. But, but, but let me tell you, but the question is, but how will you respond? That, that's the question today. And I want to show you this. Look at this. Isaiah 50, verse 6, 6. This is the prophet Isaiah who prophesied this stuff. He said, I let my enemies beat me on my bare back. So he's talking about what Jesus would say. Okay? Just think about this. So the prophet Isaiah, that's why I love God's word. Because it's not just, it's not just a word filled with religious letters and words. It's, it's, it's. A word that's filled with life and revelation and, and encouragement and inspiration. So the prophet Isaiah is literally, he is, he is repeating the very words that Jesus would say while he's experiencing this Good Friday crucifixion. And he says, I let my enemies beat me on my back, on my bare back. How many know that Satan did not take the life of Jesus? Jesus gave it for us. There's nothing has ever taken it. Jesus was willingly willing to give his life. And so it says, he says, I, I let them beat me on my bare back. I let them pull the hair out of my beard. Just imagine his beard literally being ripped off of his face. Just think about, because I want you to understand what your Lord and Savior has done for you. I want you maybe... 
those that are sitting out there that you're struggling with faith, you're struggling with believing in, in God, you're struggling with believing in this Messiah, this Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus, I want you to understand how much he loved you. I mean, this, this Savior literally is being ripped his hairs off of his face. It says, I didn't turn my face away when they made fun of me and they spit on me. I love that about Jesus. In Isaiah 52, same thing, prophet is prophesying. Verse 14, he says, and many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so scarred that he no longer looked like a person. Another translation says he no longer looked like a human being. His body was so twisted that he did not look like a human being anymore. This is what Christ did for us. And so Isaiah 60, verse 2, look at this. And so just, just think, this is all that's happening on the crosses. You have the three crosses, and, and, and all of a sudden, some things begin to, to go into play. Look what Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2 says. It says, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. I, listen, when I read a verse like that, I can't help but think about the darkness that is literally covering the whole earth. Many of us think when we see the movie of Jesus, we see Jesus and he says, it is finished. And then uh, there's this big cloud that goes over the cross and it's dark. No, no, no. It's darkness covered the earth, the whole entire earth. When you think about the darkness that we see today in our society, I have not seen as many people or heard or read about how many um, amazing people, people that God loves, people that Jesus died for. But there are more people on antidepressants than ever before in our society. There are people that are hurting and broken. There are people, and you know, I, it's, it's like in the last three years I've been hearing this more and more. I keep hearing it in the church more than anywhere else where people are being triggered by things that were traumatic that took place in their life when they were five years old, eight years old, ten years old. It's almost like in the last three years. And it, there's that number three again, right? But let me talk to you about number three in a little bit. It's like in the last three years, there's this bit like this, this unveiling that's been happening where people are literally now experiencing or remembering the things and the darkness they experience. But you know what? I really believe that it is the grace of God that he's allowing it to happen because God wants to bring resurrection life back into his church God wants to remove the veil God wants to bring healing but it can't happen until we face our reality you can't you know why because your victory is in progress right now your victory look at two people and just tell me your victory is in progress if they looked at you weird just smile okay let's keep going let's keep going it says this in Luke chapter 23. Now let's bring it New Testament style. Because we, we saw the prophetic. We saw Isaiah. Isaiah 3,000 years was already talking about Good Friday. He was already talking about, I mean, it sounds like, like it wasn't a victory. But re be reminded, Jesus literally allowed himself to go through it so that you and I can have a victory. Jesus was literally setting us up for victory. Literally, just think about that. Everything that he did on that cross, he was doing it to set you up for your healing, to set you up for redemption, to set you up for deliverance, to set you up for everything that he wants you to experience, your purpose, your calling. Jesus was already setting every single one of us up for a great victory. But look what he says. Because you know what? Jesus was a man yet without sin, but he feels, he experienced he, he, he went through everything that every single human being experiences on this earth, yet he was without sin. And look, look at this moment he has in, in Luke 23, verse 44 through 45. It says, it was now only midday, so midday, 12 o'clock. It says, and yet the whole world became dark. The whole world became dark. The whole world became dark. We live in a dark world right now, don't we? That's why, listen, it's not, ooh, the world is getting darker. No, it's, ooh, the church is getting brighter. 
Come on. The light is breaking forth. That's why Jesus says, and his light will arise upon you. That's what God wants for us. And so he goes on to say, and it was now only midday, yet the whole world became dark for three hours as the light of the sun faded away. If you keep reading in Matthew, this is what Jesus says when all this is going down. Okay, so everything is going dark, right? Everyone thinks Satan is laughing. The people are laughing. The Roman soldiers are, everyone is thinking defeated. But Jesus is undefeated and remains undefeated to this day. But here's what he's going through. In Matthew 27, 46, you can, that's your own scripture to look up later. But he said, and about the ninth hour, everybody say the ninth hour. Okay, look at this. But about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthana. That is to say, my God, my God, what hast thou, why have you forsaken me? Why, what's that word forsaken? Think about this for a second. God understands our human nature. Many times you can find yourself in a place of hardship and you feel like, where is God? Sometimes you've been praying for healing in your body or you've been praying to have child because you haven't been able to bear children or you've been praying regarding your children coming back to Christ or you've been praying for that career or you've been praying for that job or you've been praying for that breakthrough. You've been praying for that miracle and you just kind of feel like, God, where are you? Jesus is telling God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me? Why do I feel alone? And we know what that scripture means. That's simply God saying, God so loved you and me. He said, I needed something holy, pure, undefiled, without blame, without spot. And his, his name is Jesus. But the moment that Jesus took the sins of this entire world, think about it every addiction you've experienced. Think about every evil word that's come out of our mouth. Think about every single lie that we have made. Think about every single hurt that we have created. Forget, let's not just talk about who hurt us. What about the people that we have hurt? The people that we have damaged? The people that we have failed? The people that we have betrayed? What about those people? So it's not just about Look at me, woe is me. But, but God, God in his almighty grace, he had to turn his back on his son for just a second. It wasn't that he gave up on his son. It's just that the father couldn't look, couldn't bear to look at all the, the sin of this world, your sin, my sin, and see it and look at it. God had a divine reason. He had a divine purpose for why his son was dying on that cross you cannot forget the power of the cross does that cross still is it still relevant to you come on we don't hear much about the cross in church anymore you know why because it's not relevant it's not cool it doesn't connect are you serious it's the only it's the only thing that saves Why'd you forsake me? And we know if you really study, if you go in deep, it's not my message. But if you read Psalms 22.1, it was, it, was, it was Jesus fulfilling the scripture of what David had written about what he would have to do on that cross. Just think about all this is divine. Everybody say divine. divine. See, there's stuff that happens by, you know, accident. <laughs> and then there's things that when something happens by divine, that means that it was God's design. Right? So God had divinely set us up for victory. Whatever you're facing right now, God has set you up for a divine time at this hour right now. At this hour right now. I love it. He had a divine redemption plan through his son. And we know we've all felt forsaken. We've all have felt. Maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe right now you feel like, man, where is God? Maybe right now you feel like, I've been praying. I'm not getting any, any answers to my prayer. Maybe you've been standing. You've been quoting every scripture. Maybe you're someone that's been going to prayer meetings. You're someone that's been trying to go to every possible church you could think of, of, of every possible kind of style of faith. I don't know. And you just can't seem to find that rest and that peace. Let me tell you something. Your peace is only found in Jesus. You can't find it anywhere else. 
can't find a good book. I love this. If you look at the, at the Hebrew time frame, uh, you see that when he said that on the sixth hour, that meant that at 12 noon until the ninth hour, the sixth hour was at, three, at 12 o'clock until the ninth hour was 3 o'clock. So for three hours, he's talking about this darkness. And, and when you think about this number ninth on the ninth hour, the third hour, that, that number nine is the largest and last digit correlating this. Look at this. It means finality and divine completeness. And the second meaning is this. It's also the wrath of God as a judgment. But let me just talk about this. Because right now we are in a prophetic year, whether you believe that or not. I'm telling you right now, 2019 is a prophetic year. God is divinely completing some things this year, right now. And, and I really believe that there are some things that you've been dealing with internally. There are some things that maybe you have been facing in family. Maybe there are some things that you have been facing with your own demons. But God is about to do a complete and finish work inside of every single person. But we got to come back to that place where we allow ourselves to position ourselves and say, Lord, I'm going to stop rebelling and I'm going to start receiving. See, what cross did you walk in with this day? Because there's something about that nine. We're in 2019. God is doing something on this earth right now. And God is divinely completing some things. And in other words, God is about to turn some things around for your life because he is good. He's about to turn, he's about to shift some things. Maybe there's some stuff you've been facing year after year. Maybe addictions that you've been going through. Maybe habits that have been literally sucking the life out of you. God is saying, if you just come to the cross of redemption, I'm about to turn some things around for you. But we got to go ahead and come back to that place. God is turning your divine pressure and power into divine wholeness and completion. Get ready for that. I'm speaking to some people tonight. I'm telling you. In other words, what the devil meant for bad, God's going to use it for your good. I'm telling you. Yes, we give the Lord a hand clap for that. Let me finish with this. Look at someone and say, your fight is fixed. That's awesome right there. Come on. That means that before you even got into the ring, the Lord went before you. Isn't that amazing? Like before you, you thought you were going in there about to go and throw down with the enemy. God's like, boy, girl, I already took care of it. You gotta, we have to come to the place where we have to let God fight our battles for us. We have to stop wrestling Remember, the number nine is, a, is it's the number of completion. That means that God is trying to complete some ways of thinking as well. God is trying to finalize some attitudes. God is trying to deal and address some issues of our heart. And God wants to do it in this year, 29, the year of 2019. There's something God wants to do in every single one of our lives. And the number three, check this out. And I love this because we're talking about the third day, the number three. The number three means this. It means divine wholeness, divine healing, divine completeness, divine perfection. It means growth and multiplication. Listen, God did everything with divine purpose. The number nine, the number three. Think about the numbers that God has put in. They're not in there. I mean, he wrote, he wrote a whole book called Numbers. <laughs> a whole book called Numbers. Obviously, it meant something to him. Number. I mean, your number means something, right? How old are you? That means something, right? How long you've been married? That means something. How many years have you been walking with God? That should mean something. So numbers are powerful, we love numbers here. You know why? I wonder how many number of families are we going to see healed in this place. I wonder how many number of healings are we going to see in this house. I wonder how many number of children we're going to see come back to God. I wonder. I wonder what that number is. Let's end with this. Luke 23 verse 39, 43. Let's finish talking about the guys on this cross. Look at this. It says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering, he rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, 
seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, now listen, I, I want to share some things because both are suffering the pain of crucifixion. Both are experiencing the same type of trauma in their physical body. Both are criminals. Both are thieves. They're both experiencing the same thing. But the first thief says, are you not the Christ? The rebellious one is like, aren't you the man? Aren't you the one they call the Savior? Aren't you the one they say who is to come and to bring the redemption? So he's literally hearing all the shouts of the people that are cursing Jesus while he's on the cross. And this guy has the attitude to go ahead and chime in with everybody else, with all the other doubters. Be careful who you hang with. Watch it, because before you know it, you can be on the cross of rebellion where you're also agreeing with them. Yeah, you're right. You know what? God doesn't answer prayer. Yeah, you know what? You're right. God doesn't move anymore. Yeah, you're right. God's presence isn't experienced anymore. Be careful what you say, because you know what? You don't have to be so far off in sin to be in rebellion. You can literally be in a place where you already have the attitude, God I have been praying and you have not been moving. I have been believing and you have not been shaking. God, I have been faithful. I have been loyal. And you start telling God of all of your acclamations and all of your resume of how good you've been. And you can literally begin to tell Jesus, well, if you're so God, why aren't you coming down here? If you're all that, then why aren't you moving on my marriage? If you're all that, why aren't you saving my kids? That, my friend, can be the spirit of rebellion. So it doesn't matter whether you've been someone that's been far away from God and you know you're a sinner. We've all been sinners. We've all missed the mark. But you can be a Christian sitting here right now and have that attitude where you're questioning, if you're God, then why aren't you moving? That's what this guy told him. If you're God, then why don't you get Man, if you're Jesus, then save us. And the other guy's like, what are you doing? What are you saying? See, so many of us, let's be honest with ourselves. We should be able to, we should take responsibility for what we did. And stop blaming God and just accept the fact that maybe, maybe some of the things we're experiencing, not all, but maybe some things that you and I are facing right now have been things that we created. Situations that, that we made things that we allowed and and we're we're mad at God because he's not moving fast enough and 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 you keep telling God how good you are let me tell you something not one person in this room on this earth is good without God the only reason we're good is because God is good outside of God we're no good take that to the bank we can all be like that first thief he says, come on. He says, bring me down off this cross, Jesus. If you're such a good Savior, get me up out of this sickness. If you're such a good Savior, then, then fix my financial mess. If you're this good Savior, then, then get me out of this lousy job. If you're such a good Savior, then, then get me out of this lousy marriage or fix this lousy marriage. Hmm. Why aren't you moving me with your God? Ah. Hmm. It never entered his mind. Think about it. It never entered his mind to tell Jesus, I'm so sorry. It never. I wonder if that hasn't entered your mind. Just to say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive. Has it entered your mind? Today as we celebrate Good Friday, has it entered your mind that we must repent? Has it entered your mind? Regardless of where you've been, listen, God's not afraid of your mess. God's not afraid of your dirt. God's not afraid. God's not, God's not disillusioned because of the poor choices you made. God is just saying, can you humble yourself? Let's keep going quickly, quickly. Let me give you some points. The first thing the repentant thief does is this. I believe that Luke wrote this in the Bible because he wanted us to learn, not from the guy that was 
being all rebellious, but I really believe that he allowed us to see the two options we have. The first thing the repentant thief does is, number one, is he says that he, he doesn't get deceived by all the doubters. Number one, don't get deceived by all the people that maybe you're around people that are like, come on, man, why are you going to church tonight? That's so stupid. Like, why? You know you're never going to change. You know where you were last night. Come on, you were glue, 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 clubbing, 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 right? They're, they're, they're like, come on, you're never going to change. That was my family. When I got saved, they're like, okay, Mauricio, we'll see how long that'll last. Listen, don't, don't, don't hook up, don't link up with the haters. Don't do that. He rebuked the guy. He told, he told the God, do you not fear God? The second thing about this regretful thief was, number two, he feared God. He's, dude, he's, he's a criminal, guilty as charged. And yet he knows that he is about to die. He knows that he's about to face a judgment beyond this earth. And he has this fear of God. He feared God. God was real to him. God was his creator. God was the only one who could save him. Number three, the third thing about this regretful thief was this. He admitted that he had done wrong. Look what he said in verse 41 of that verse. He says, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. He said, man, we deserve this. Maybe you're sitting here today. And maybe you've been a little bit off. And maybe there's some stuff that's happening in your life and you're saying, you know, Pastor, I can totally relate with this guy. I do deserve some of the things I'm experiencing. But let me tell you something. Though you may deserve it, God wants to save you from it. He wasn't defending himself anymore. He wasn't defending his sin anymore. He wasn't defending his, his, his lack of, he wasn't making excuses anymore. He said, I'm wrong. Can you make me right? The fourth thing about this regretful thief was this. He accepted his punishment as deserved. He accepted it. Verse 41, he says, we are under the sentence of condemnation justly. It's amazing how much humility this guy comes to. Like, man, he's just like, I mean, just look, rebellion, regret. But God changed his R of regret to an R of redemption. That's the real test of humility before God. When you can say, Lord, I'm wrong. I deserve this, but please forgive me. The fifth thing and the final thing about this regretful thief was this. He said, he acknowledges that indeed Jesus is king. That's all you got to do today. Acknowledge that you're not king anymore. We need to dethrone us so that we can put him back on the throne. Amen. There's been too much king stomach, right? Too much king me, too much king. And God's saying, hey, listen, remove, remove your kingdom and bring in my kingdom. See, your kingdom is thingdom. His kingdom is kingdom. There's your thingdom, then there's his kingdom. Which one do you want? Thingdom, kingdom. Thingdom, kingdom. I want his kingdom. And look what he says. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Stand to your feet. Let's get out of here. Stand to your feet. And look what Jesus said to him. He said, surely I say to you, he says, today, look at this. Everybody say, today. today. I love this. I love this because he's, he's, he's going through this whole converse. I mean, look how much Jesus loves us. He's hanging on a cross. The other two guys didn't get a beat down like Jesus. Jesus was twisted. Jesus was ripped. His whole face was disfigured. He was ripped to shreds, and he still has so much love that he's willing to have a conversation with this guy. Who knows how long this conversation was, but he, on a cross, he's having a conversation. In other words, God is saying to us, I don't care how much pain you're in. I'm willing to sit with you and have coffee with you. We need to stop having coffee with the devil and start having coffee with some Lord and Savior and start talking about those things, that pain. And God's going to be like, okay, tell me what more. I'm angry. Okay. What are you angry about? You're never on time. Okay, but do I show up? Yes, I'm on time. It's not your timetable, it's my timetable, amen? 
He said, today, listen, he said, today, why, why didn't this guy get saved maybe weeks earlier? Why didn't he get saved months earlier? Why didn't he get saved three years when Jesus started the ministry? Because there's a time for everything under the sun. You're not too far that God can't save you. You're not too far. Jesus says, today, I'll save you. I'll save your family. I'll save your life. I'll save your health. I'll save your mind. I'll save your children. I'll save you today. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Hey, man, can you imagine what that looked like? Wow. And the guy's like, all right. And at the ninth hour, at three o'clock, after Jesus finished his conversation with the people, he said, Erica, it is finished. It is, Isaac, it is finished, son. Lexi, it is finished. Can you imagine what that guy, his reaction when he opened his eyes after dying? In paradise. Paradise refers to heaven. I bet he was like, what? I don't, and Jesus is going to be like, come on, let's go. If you're here tonight, and maybe you've been far away from God because you were like me one, at one point. I was an atheist at one point. That's why I'm this wild Mexican guy, okay? So if you're like, why is he so loud? Because I know what I've been saved from. I was going to hell, and then God saved me. I was the rebellious thief, but God redeemed me. I'm here to tell you, it does not matter how far you are. God's not afraid of your questions. God's not afraid of your doubts. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to forgive you of your sins, to redeem you of the curse, and to save your soul so that one day you and I can stand in glory in heaven and you will see the sun arise again. That's what we're about to see. So if you're here and you're someone that has never invited Jesus into your heart, I'm going to do an invitation in a second. And when I do that, I'm going to count to three, and your hand's going to go up. Why? Because you know what I'm telling you. It's real. You're feeling the presence of God. If you're just like thinking like, whoa, this, this sounds so real. It's not me. It's Jesus touching you right now. Or maybe you're the Christian that's sitting in here, and you've been so rebellious with your attitude. You've been denying God. You've been angry at God. You've been mad at God. You've been blaming God. And we've all been there. When my niece died, when she was killed, I had a moment where I was like, ah, I serve you. I prayed. 22 years old and she's killed. I can't understand why. But I immediately got back and said, God, but I trust you. I, I still believe you. You're still good. I may not understand why, but I know you're faithful. And I thank God I led my niece to Jesus three months before she went home to be with Jesus. Three months before she went home to be with Jesus. She sat in this church and she gave her life to Christ. And she was a hater of God. Then just became this lover of Jesus. And I'm here to tell you whether you're far away from God or whether you have fallen from God. He redeems today. When I counted three, if that's you and you're saying for the first time, you're saying, yes, I'm receiving Christ. Or you're someone that's a Christian and you're saying, I need to get my life right. It's for you too. At the count of three, you'll lift your hand high in the air. Are you ready? Every eye closed, every head bowed, just between you and God. Ready? And we're going to all pray together. One, come on, don't be afraid. Two, he loves you. Ready? Three, if that's you, lift your hand high. If that's you, you're saying, I'm receiving Christ tonight. Lift your hand high quickly. Quickly, I see all those hands. Anyone else? Lift it high. Lift it high. Good, good, good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Very good, very good. Look at me, all of you that lifted your hands. Look at me. Look at me, all of you that lifted your hands. I want you all to pray this with me. Pray this. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, every one of them. Today, tonight, 
it's a new day. It's a new beginning. I receive Christ as Lord and Savior. He is King. He is Lord of my life. I'm born again, filled with His Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you all agree with that, say amen. 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 Awesome. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.